Dr. David Halperin on nudge theory. I know this is something that a lot of people have uh, been talking about, and there have been a lot of questions about how to apply it. And so we thought it would be very valuable to get somebody like David with his experience who's been able to apply it in government uh, in many parts of the world to give us some of his thoughts on both nudge theory as well as how it can be applied in our current circumstances. It really is an honor to introduce uh, Dr. David Halpern. He is the president and founding director of Behavioral Insights Team, uh, BIT. Uh, it's a UK-based global social purpose organization that generates and applies behavioral insights to inform policy and improve public services. Dr. Halpern was the first research director of the Institute for Government and was the chief analyst at the Prime Minister Strategy Unit and the What Works National Advisor, leading efforts to improve the use of evidence across the functioning of the UK government. So he's actually applied it there, and I think that's why this is so valuable for us. He has written several books and papers on areas relating to behavioral insights and well being, such as social capital. Hidden Wealth of Nations, and is co-author of the Mind Space Report. In 2015, Dr. Halpern wrote a book titled Inside the Nudge Unit, How Small Changes Can Make a Big Difference, of which we imagine Dr. Halpern will have the most interesting bits to share with us shortly. Uh, we extend a very warm welcome to you, uh, David. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, may I, what The way we're going to do this is uh, I'll ask a series of questions uh, that will allow David to expand on uh, what uh, he would have liked to talk about, just so we have some breaks. And I'd encourage anyone who has questions to please send us questions on the chat uh, link here, right? And then we will pick up a few of these, uh, and uh, we will ask Dr. Halperin those after the first wave of uh, his comments gets over. Uh, so with that, Dr. Halperin, uh, may I now request you for your opening remarks on the foundational principles of nudge theory and its applicability in the public policy in public policy initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. It's great to be with you. Um, the work that you do in the CBC is really important. You know, if we can make more effective public servants, you know, that's a, a wonderful thing, to, important thing to do in the world. Yeah, what are the foundational principles? I mean, at essence, it's a simple thing, which is, can we understand what really you know, drives human behavior? I mean, think about it in our own behavior. You know, most of us intend to eat more healthily, maybe, or exercise a little better, or get our paperwork done in time, um, or save more for our children. There are lots of things we intend to do, and then often we fail to do it. And why is that? So if you like, nudge theory is based on understanding what actually drives human behavior, why we often you know, leave things till tomorrow, for example, because, you know, essentially it's called present bias, but, you know, understand human behavior and that it would lead us to different policies. So in government, you might think, well, the way we change behavior is to pass a law, we'll make it illegal, we'll have um, a sanction, or maybe we'll use an incentive. Those things can work, but often it's more effective to use it in some other way, such as, um, said, we'll talk about nudges, just ways to, you know, well, uh, can I just request everyone yeah. else uh, to please go on mute so that there's no echo? Uh, if I can just request everyone else to go on mute, that'll help. Thanks. Thanks, David. Please. No worries. So, you know, as opposed to governments thinking the way you get things done is by passing a law, you know, or having a sanction, you know, that can work, but often it's not the most effective way of moving behavior. Uh, and so that's what large principles are about, and they're often about. Um, sometimes called choice architectures, making it easy, for example, to do the healthy thing. So just take a simple example, a classic one often used. You're going to the canteen and within government or wherever or a CBC. And the question is, with your tray and your plate, what, come, what do you come to first? Do you come to the, the sweet, heavy, sugar, fatty food? Or do you come to the salad first? Most human beings will start filling up the plate with the first thing they come to, right? And so someone has to make a decision along the way. Would it be better to have the healthy foods first or should we have them at the end of the aisle? So that would be considered a nudge, right? Wouldn't it be a good idea to put the healthy food at the beginning because most of us start filling up our plate 
right? As opposed to you could pass a law and say, well, we all want you to eat more salad. But a nudge would be, do we make it just easier to just gently come that way? And if you don't want the salad, you can walk on by and just go straight to those sweet desserts, right? Now that's a nudge. And so the idea is, why don't we think about the world through actual human behavior and then start, you know, coming up with sometimes rather different types of policy solutions? Oh, did we lose Adele? No, no, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, could you could you provide us examples of how nudge theory has been successfully implemented in government programs or policies in different countries, including uh, any measurable outcomes? And were you able to measure the outcomes uh, coming out of this? But I think uh, actually your Absolutely. real world successes and where you applied it would be really valuable. Very happy to do that. Um, as for many people on the call, I should explain, as you'll gather from Adil's remarks, um, I spent a lot of time in government and we originally started this in the prime minister's office. Uh, it's since we've applied these techniques and helped many governments across the world. So what are concrete examples <clears throat> that broadly help us build <clears throat> health, wealth and happiness, if you like? Um, I mean, a simple example would be encouraging people to save. So in many countries, this is certainly true for Anglo-Saxon countries, we've struggled to get people to save. We've often used massive tax subsidies where we, you know, if you will save, um, you know, a pound, a rupee, a dollar for your, uh, for your pension, we'll top it up, right? And across the world, tens of billions have been spent on this. And in Britain, this is a big issue as in elsewhere, and that a lot of people didn't take up those schemes. So when we looked into it, we concluded actually one issue is that it's not just the money, it's that people had to sign up to the pension scheme. So the idea was instead of having to sign up to the scheme with the subsidies, you know, to join it, instead you turn it from an opt in to an opt out. So it's still your choice, but now you have to fill in the form to say, I, I don't want to be in the scheme. So guess what happens? You move from maybe half of people doing it to more than 90% of people stick with the default, right? They decide to, they, they join the pension scheme because it's easy to do. This is a concrete example in Britain. We made the change in 2012. Um, within a few years, we had, we moved from basically, I said, circa half to more than 90% of people eligible joining the scheme. Um, in Britain, that translated into more than 10 million people joining the scheme for a really simple, cheap change. Let's make it easy for people to join that was much more important than spending huge money on the subsidy. And just to realize how big that effect is, our best estimate for every extra dollar or pound you use for a tax subsidy, it would lead to one cent of extra saving. So the subsidies were not very effective at all, but just taking out that friction to make it an opt out instead of an opt in was a game changer. A couple of other quick examples. One thing that most governments have to deal with is administration, and an important one in that is getting people to pay their taxes. Again, our tax authorities, this is true in Britain, many places, if you're late paying your tax, we'll start sending you letters and we'll start to threaten you. We tried a variation on this for people who have been late paying their tax. We realized that actually most people do pay their tax on time. This is actually true in most countries. It was certainly true in Britain. So instead of sending the normal letter, we sent them a letter which had one line at the beginning. It just said, you know, it might say to Adil, of course, Adil would always pay his tax on time, but it might say, Adil, you know, most people in your area pay their tax on time. You're one of the few yet to do so. What does that lead to? That led to a 15% increase in the payment rate without any further change within the month following. And by the way, it also led to less complaints about letters from the tax authorities. Because you're telling some people that something is true. Did you, did you realize your fellow neighbors are much more virtuous than you thought they were? And that's a form of social pressure. We're very influenced by what other people are doing. So simply telling people through these tax letters that most people pay their tax on time led to a 15% increase in the payment rate. And that's a result, by the way, which we've replicated in quite a number of other countries with very different situations, such as in Latin America you know, and elsewhere. If I was gonna give one last example, maybe an important one, India and many countries is about health. Lots of things we could do to improve our health. Vaccination is a famous example. You know, however good your vaccine is, it's, 
it's not a vaccination until someone turns up and says, oh, yeah, you can put it in my arm, right? It's a behavioral component too. So understanding that, what is the best way to make it easy, like for, for shorten the distances, to bring it to people, to let them see that others are doing it, to use the most effective messages, to identify this work in India, where who in the social network are the key people, that they're the ones, if they get the vaccine, others will generally follow. So identifying those people and concentrating your effort on them, and then they persuade the network, leads to much, much higher take up of vaccination rates. And even the simplest example of that is when you send someone about a vaccination is you you just say to them, just think about when and how you're going to go and get it done. Prompting people to think about the mechanics of how they will do it makes them much more likely to then actually do it. It's called implementation attention. So these are very big effects. And you'll notice a common theme for many of them is that if you like the nudge intervention is often quite cheap, sometimes a lot cheaper actually than the traditional method and given very, very big results. And that's why these approaches have been taken up across so many countries, just for the practical reason that they work. And by the way, often people experience them, not only do they save money, but they're just nicer. Uh, just since you talked about taxes, David, and uh, it will be very helpful if you can talk about uh, a couple of things on taxes, which is, you know, currently most, not currently, but the most obvious thing that people do is that they send threatening letters. You know, you have not paid your tax, you know, please get to it immediately or you will be fined, right? So how, in your experience, how, how well or how badly do threats work versus nudges? Well, let's say threats can work a bit, but sometimes said nudges can work better. So I've given you that concrete example I told you about this early trial we did in the tax authority in Britain, which is to add one line. Most people pay their tax on time. By the way, particularly people in your area, right? Because they're more like you. Most people in your area give the name of it, pay their tax on time. You're one of the few yet to do so. Um, we weren't sure that would work elsewhere. So one of the things we got a request from soon after that was to do work in Latin America. Now, maybe it's an open secret, but the tax payment rate in Latin America is not high. In fact, we were asked to work in Guatemala. You definitely could not say 90% of people pay their tax on time. But even in Guatemala, when we tried a similar thing where we wrote to people and we said, I think it was 62% of people do pay this tax by so-and-so, it had a similar big effect on lifting payment rate because people were surprised by and encouraged that other people pay their tax on time. I mean, another example for small businesses, right, which is that what you really want to do is a lot of behavior is habit based rather than getting to the point where someone has not paid the tax and then you're chasing them. It's really worth encouraging them in advance. Don't forget it's coming up on the following time, et cetera, so that they don't experience that. Oh, I haven't paid my tax. And wait a minute. Nothing seems to have happened yet. Right. Why not get ahead of it? And so prompt people, just like actually with vaccination, a, a huge trial we did in Indonesia to prompt people and small businesses to, to plan ahead, to just think about if your taxes coming up and so on, made them much, much more likely, both you can get registrations up for tax for small businesses and get the tax paid on time. So yeah, it's a very nice example. Most people don't want to pay taxes. <laughs> they may not love it, but they certainly don't want to be paying their neighbors taxes because they're not paying. So it's a very lovely example, and it illustrates, I'll just mention one other point, which is across the world we've noticed that people tend to overestimate bad behavior in others, right? We notice it more, like people who don't turn up for work, they pretend they're sick, right? Or late paying their tax. We're very aware of that, and that kind of goes around. And we tend to overestimate the number of people then who are cheating on their tax, right? or uh, we would say taking a sickie who aren't working, pretending to be sick. But that itself changes our behavior. Because if you think everybody else is cheating, you think, well, it's okay. Interestingly, we don't tend to overestimate good behavior. So just even in these tax examples that telling people about, so most people pay their tax on time, leading to quite, quite significant payment increases, but actually it's quite nice in another way, which is it's, it's, making you feel better about your fellow human being 
And even, by the way, you feel more positive towards the tax authority, too, because instead of sending a threatening letter, I don't like these people, it actually feels sort of helpful and encouraging. I'm going to, I think the set of questions that people have sent in <clears throat> to me even before we started, which had to do with, this is, these are great examples, but how do I get started? You know, is this, uh, is there a systemic way of somebody think about this? Or, you know, is this just, uh, you have to be brilliant and have done a PhD before you can come up with any particular <laughs> nudge? You know, how, how does a, how does a normal civil servant in the course of their work? Yes start thinking about what do I do in whatever I'm doing or my scheme or my approach? How do you get started? It's a great, a great question. Um, and one of the wonderful things about what you're doing, of course, is that, yeah, why should you have to go to Harvard and do a PhD? C can we learn those things? And we spent a long time because we work with public servants to, can we just encapsulate a simple thing to, that you might remember? And so one that we use is if you want to um, influence behavior is go east. Go east to the, the four letters, E-A-S-T. Think about those things. So the E is easy. Make it easy. Be obsessed about making it as easy as possible. Can we just take away one little form? Could, do they have to do three forms? Can we do it in one? When you're doing it online, can we take away a click or two? Can we make it easy? Can we make it easy for you to get the salad first? Be obsessed about making it easy. So this is a massive influence on all our behavior, right? And so sometimes, for example, on tax avoidance, if it's difficult or effortful to comply, far fewer people will do it. And we should be obsessed about make it easy. So that, that's the East, E. Attractive, how would you break through? Not even just, also even attaching, breaking through, getting your attention. So if a letter is coming from the tax authority, it would be better that it says, David, you haven't done the following thing. I'll notice it, right? Or even, by the way, a simple example on tax is what's on the envelope makes a difference, right? It turns out some letters that look like they're from government, people ignore. Whereas we did a trial a number of years ago where we literally wrote on the hand, like, you know, don't ignore this. We hand wrote on 5,000 letters. Much higher response rate. How do you make it attractive? How do you make it attractive in other ways? You know, so it might, it's not just money. But it might be appealing in other ways. So what are other people doing and so on? Um, the, um, the, the S is social. We've already touched on that as an example. The real nudges in our lives aren't people like you, Adil, or me, or government folks. They're the people around you. They're your mother. They're your mother-in-law. They're your brother. They're your friends, right? Social. What are other people doing? So you really want to think about that, about as a channel of influence thinking about the social, um, and it also even reciprocity would be an example. I'm gonna try and help you do this, could you do this? So in public services, for example, it's worth sometimes reminding people to say, we've done this thing for you, could you now do this thing for us? Because that's what we do in our lives, social. And the last one that sometimes miss, get missed is the T on East, timely. So thinking about human behavior and think about your own too, is that a lot of what we do is habit based, right? We get up in the morning, we do the same thing. Or I roll out of bed, I, go, I brush my teeth, I go to work. It becomes habit based and automatic. And habits, as we all know, are really hard to change, right? We get into a routine, you know, someone from government comes along and says, well, you should do this thing differently. Well, that's not what I've done for years. So we really want to look out for timely moments, they're called. And that particularly tends to be something which is where your behavior has been disrupted. An example across the world would be trying to get people to travel in more environmentally sustainable ways, particularly interesting for India, of course. But, you know, in many Western countries, we're trying to get people out of their cars and onto bikes. Now, you may have lots of people in India who are busy going the other way. How do you get people to love their bike and cycle? Um, one of the key things to do is even if you run big campaigns and you go and talk to people one to one, it's still pretty hard work to get someone to change their, their transport habit. But if you've just moved house or there's some other change in your life, like maybe your kids are going to school, your behavior is disrupted. And at that time, people are very likely to adopt a new change. 
So we found that in many areas, you look out for when there's a change or disruption in someone's life, that's a key moment to affect a change. And of course, governments often know when they are, right? We're often involved. We can see in administration, we're there at people's changes in their lives. Someone's joining a school, they've moved house, they need to do something different, right? Those are absolutely key moments within which behind uh, change can be done. So if you don't want to do the PhD, just try and remember that simple mnemonic, EAST. Easy, attractive, social, timely. Think about those things and what you're doing. You don't have to be in the center of government doing important new laws. Everybody in their lives are normally influencing behavior, trying to get people to do something different. What could you do to make it easy, attractive, social, timely? I think that's a very good mnemonic uh, to remember. So it is, as you said, it meets your criteria, right? It's easy, it's attractive, uh, it's social, and it's timely. So uh, that's perfect. Yeah. I'm going to come and ask you about, uh, you know, India is uh, <clears throat> almost nothing you can say about India applies to all Indians. You know, we are more diverse than Europe is. We have more uh, different, we have X number, you know, we have six, seven official religions. We have 22 languages, 700 dialects, huge amount of differences in how people think. How do we think about some of these principles uh, in the context of A, India's diversity, to its scale? Well, obviously, it's profound. And as you say, I mean, I approach this with, you know, humility. India is so enormous that and diverse. The world pivots on India, right? The rest of us are, are, are well aware of that. Um, so there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is we've been surprised ourselves. We We didn't know that results from American you know, universities would work in Europe, let alone India. And we, we, when we adopted this in government um, in Britain and else, elsewhere, we tested a lot and we'll come back to testing. So we, would it work, right? And we've been surprised how much of this stuff has worked. And I gave you the example earlier about taking a tax intervention that worked in Britain to Latin America, where a lot of people didn't pay their tax and it still worked. So there's something about the kind of East basic principle that seems to work in most human beings are human beings. We've all got things in our lives. We're all trying to help our kids. And that's more important than what someone from government is telling me, maybe. So a lot of those basic principles seem to apply. But there are clearly differences, too. So even, for example, the social, the social norms that you know are very powerful, um, the social norms will differ in different places, certainly across India. But the fact that we are influenced by our social network, we have yet to find a place in the world where people are not influenced by those around them, but the content of the social network would differ. Another key difference, of course, very practically, is language. So we've learned that language matters a lot. If you're writing an official form, for example, and you, you, you're writing these letters out and people aren't responding, maybe they literally haven't understood what you've said. So you really want to be obsessed about, you know, do I, you know, is this very clear to the people who are reading it, even the most basic? And you're dealing with many languages, many contexts. You can't just take that thing and translate it, right? And so one of the things, the, the basic principle I would add, as this word we often use, is humility. So behavioral science can give you some very good clues about human beings. There are clearly some big differences. There's big differences, often you may know, between so-called weird psychologies in the West versus non-weird, they're, they're really important. So be humble. So this is a good idea, test it. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, right? So I think that is really good advice for all of us, which is, and particularly in India where there's so much diversity, is take the ideas and the inspiration, but with humility, let's test them in this context. Did it work, right? And, and then learn, create a feedback loop from that. So that, that is, I think, our most critical advice is be humble, try it in the context, see if it works. It might not work, but it might work. And it might be some variation in the approach which will work differently. I can give Just, you a uh, Yeah. No, no, go ahead, please give a practical example. Go ahead. Well, look, I'll give you a simple one, which is as the world is joined up, as you know, we um, look at our prime minister and the, the diversity of Britain as well as the diversity of India. but. 
you see these strange phenomena. So an example would be in a number of Western countries is where we have people coming for, actually from uh, often from India or other places in the world. And in our healthcare systems, which are struggling, our hospitals are overloaded and we're encouraging people go to see your general practitioner. Don't go straight to hospital. There's an actual cultural difference, which is in a number of countries you may be aware. People think a real doctor is a hospital doctor. They think you think doctor, you think white coat in a hospital. That's what a doctor is. Right. So in some groups, even within diversity and said in the West, you have to then think you have to explain to people why a GP, a general practitioner, is also a good doctor. Otherwise, they won't go there. Right. They just go straight to the hospital. So even that diversity is playing back into a Western culture, as well as, of course, the diversity you have within India. Right. I wanted to ask you, because you were talking about letters and things like that, which is is. Uh, do people re are nudges, as you said, keep uh, you know, are nudges? Do nudges work better when they are simple? Do complicated letters or long letters just is that the antithesis of nudges? So, in general, uh, keep it easy. So that includes letters, keep them short, simple, and so on. One of the most basic interventions before you do anything complicated is to look at your letter and your communication and say. Could I have said it in half the words? I'll tell you a beautiful, I mean, a lot of our work you'll gather we do is big scale randomized control trials, but sometimes the simpler ones. There's one from Singapore a few years ago. We worked with Singapore for many years where some official had a great idea on your point, Adele, which is to say, when we're writing all these letters, we're, you know, we're very clever people in the ministry. Why don't we write on the bottom of it? If you think you could have written this more clearly, let us know, right? They actually put it on the letter. And this is a big employment um, agency. And anyway, nothing happened very much, first of all. But a couple of months later, someone wrote back with one of their letters, which had been rewritten. And they take it to the perm set. They had a part, and they're all looking at it. It's half the length. And everyone, actually, this is much better, isn't it? This person really has done it better. <laughs> and of course, you're much more likely to understand and act on it if you understood it, right? So it's a beautiful illustration of, well, why not do that? You know, did people understand it? By the way, it turned out it was a retired civil servant who had rewritten it. <laughs> so that's a funny twist to the story. But if, literally, if you don't understand it, you're, you're not likely to do it. And, and even a, the simplest example of this is when you take many letters, if you look at it and you have to look, you, if you have to read it three times saying, what is the CDC asking me to do? What does Adil want me to do? Right. And I have to read it through. Then it's not working. So does it say right at the beginning? So a simple example, an early trial we did on getting people to pay their tax or a fine, actually, it was a parking fine. You know, you're looking at this, it's really hard. What, have I, what am I supposed to do? What's wrong? And then I have to turn it over to find out how do I pay? But, so we just, we redid it and just said, you know, you write a big stamp at the top, you know, pay this bill now. Like really, and then this is how you do it like very, very basic, has very, very big impact sizes, right? As simple, as clearly as possible. And in even a trivial one from Danny Kahneman, who's very famous for behavioral science. You know, if you, if you write something, if you write it in bold, as opposed to normal text, people are more likely just to believe it. You know, just incredible. Yes, it matters. Right? What, so about, what about colors? What about colors? Have you seen anything on colors? Hello, so we do all these things. Yes. So again, a letter, um, you know, there's a reason why companies often learn that, you know, they're giving you a gentle reminder when the letter goes red. You're like, oh, OK, now I need to deal with it. But is that something you do in many parts of India? Certainly most parts of the world. It's like a lot of people will ignore the letter until it is in red. And then, oh, now I have to pay it. Right. But even color contrast. So it stands out. Um, one thing I'll just say is that. So we're slightly obsessed about this. You know, if you've got a letter and you're sending it out, do you send the same letter to everyone? What, why do you do that? Why wouldn't you test variations to see if one works better than another? And of course, as we go digital and as India is doing very fast, you can test that much more. So called AB formatting, test variations. And you learn to be humble pretty fast. So you can test variations to see what works. 
And we've done this sometimes where we've tested a variation. And then we've also asked leading people and said, which do you think will work best? They're often wrong. I'll give you a simple example from a number of years ago. We tested at something to do with organ donation, right? So in many countries, there's a problem with organ donation, which is not enough people donate their organs, even if it was their wish. And so you do a version of signing people up so that it's their wishes expressed. And in the, if a very unfortunate event, they you know are in a car accident or something, would they like their organs to be used? So we ran this trial with a million people and we tried eight variations. And the way of doing it was that you can, in Britain, you can sign up automatically, if you like, to an organ donor register. And then it's linked to your, your record. And we tried variations. Um, and one of the variations where we had different pictures, right? And um, one of the things everybody thought would work really well was a variation, which would be just, it was a smiley, happy people, a group of people saying, you know, do this thing. We actually found it backfired. It made people less likely to sign up than a single picture of a single person, like a patient or someone in need, right? So these things can be very consequential. And one of the great advice is to, everybody is you know, doing these things, writing letters, even if you're just talking to someone, what's the right or the wrong way of doing it? It's really worth having a degree of humility and saying, well, on color variation or anything else, well, maybe it will work better. Adele's got this idea, if we write it all in green, it will work better. Maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. Why don't we try it out and then see does it work better? So you can get some very big advantages from doing this, because if you get a 5% or a 10% improvement, you know, that's a very big deal by just changing the color or the wording. And that's, of course, very finally, that's what the big tech giants are doing corporately. Whenever you buy something online, they're now continually testing variations, like the size of the button, the color, the position. And often it makes no difference, but they're finding these little tiny effects. Well, why wouldn't we be doing that in government, folks? Of course we should be doing that. Make it easy, make it easy, make it attractive. So it's gonna push you on that because we now have often, we have now moved from letters in many cases, we send out millions of letters to SMSs, text messages, to WhatsApp messages, to phone calls. And have you any comments on, from a nudge standpoint, what works or doesn't work, what should you watch out for? So yes, of course. I mean, one of the things I would say across all those platforms is keep testing. And one of the great advantages of going digital is it becomes much easier to test variations. This is an enormous advantage of digital and of course to track responses. So it gives you a huge new set of tools and levers. The game also changes a bit when you go from various platforms. So Adil, your beautifully scripted letter that you might have written a few years ago, you definitely are not going to do that on a text. Like, you know, we're in a world of WhatsApp and text. Now you have to compress it into a very short message, right? So what will work and people won't go very far. And similarly, some of the things that work um, will vary. I mean, I'll give you a real example. Um, during COVID, um, of course, we were very involved in encouraging people to you know, get tested and isolate. And so we were able to test with millions of people, variations of, you know, your vaccine is now ready. Adelie, it's time for you to go and get your vaccine, you know, go and do it, et cetera. To, to work out which, what in that very small number of words should we say? So I'll tell you in the British context, the best thing to do is to say, you've reached the top of the queue. People in Britain love queuing. What is that about, right? And it's fair. I've reached the top of the queue. So if you say you've reached the top of the queue, people were significant more likely then to go and get their jab. It might be a few percent, but that's still really worth doing. The other thing to watch out for, Adele, is um, when things go online, some aspects of the frictions also change. In an everyday life, one of the things you might see, it, we, we talk a lot about choice architecture or um, like in the pensions example, opt in or opt out. When you go digital, the frictions can subtly change. You know, so when you book an airline, they often historically they would say, would you like this extra thing or a car insurance? And you click that box. People are learning that I should look at those things and unclick them. Right. So that the digital environment 
is different because it has different frictions of certain kinds, some advantages, some disadvantages. And so you can't assume that you'll get an exact translation of the behavior in the physical world into the digital world. Some of those things do change. I uh, just uh, request everyone after another five minutes, we're going to take questions from the audience. If you have a question, please send it uh, on, on the chat over here. But I have a couple more that I wanted to ask. Uh, David, recently we've been reading about some things on, are there some ethical considerations uh, and potential criticisms associated with using nudge theory in public governance? I mean, what are those and how can they be addressed? So yes, there's been much discussion about this, particularly in America and the UK, actually in the Anglo-Saxon countries, where one of the concerns is, is that, is it somehow not ethical? So if this stuff is really powerful, let's go back to the simple canteen example. And we've adults figured out that he can get you all to eat more salad by bringing it forward. Well, is that ethical or is that not, right? That seems okay. But it's often being used, not least by commercial players, in abusive ways, right? So that what are sometimes called dark patterns on the digital world, right? So that the way in which you configure the requests or the choices can have big impacts on people's behavior, but it feels like it's wrong. You know, a simple everyday example you might see in your life is something called drip pricing, not by government, but elsewhere. You, you're trying to decide whether to buy something. You think, I'll go there. You, you fill it all in at the end. And then it says, and there's this extra charge, it's this carrier charge. It's still like, oh God. The thing is, most people won't go all the way back and change, right? That feels wrong. It feels manipulative, right? So, one of the arguments about nudge is that if it's so effective and it's powerful, and sometimes maybe you're not fully aware of it, right? So that now we're writing your letter saying most of your neighbors pay on time. Is that ethical? Is that somehow a manipulation? Um, my own view and that of many folks such as Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein is that one of the great advantages of nudging is that it, it should be transparent. You should be able to see what is going on and therefore actually it still leaves the choice with you. But that matters. Um, I think that's at least a part answer. But one of the ways it also plays out is who decides. So if it matters, the so-called choice architecture is influencing your behavior. Who should decide, be it in the canteen or another variation on food would be how much you eat, you know, is strongly affected by how big the plate is. The bigger your plate, the more you eat, be it at home or outside in restaurants. Did you decide the size of the plate or did someone else decide the size? You know, who decides? And so one of the key questions, I think, particularly, especially given the diversity uh, across India, is that actually maybe it isn't just for people like me or even you on this call to decide. One of our roles is to is to say to communities, this is what's influencing your behavior. It has quite a big impact. How should we set it? So, for example, should you get the parents in the school to say, how should the canteen be? Right. Explain to them the power of the behavioral influences and then we should decide or the community should decide. So I'm a big believer. Not everyone would say the same of when we use these behavioral approaches in government. We should also strengthen its connection to the ability of the community or even the social movement to decide, right? And so you might think of it as who shapes the shapers? These things around us about how we save, what we eat, what we do, influence our behavior strongly. Who makes that decision, right? And so I think that's quite an interesting and important role for an ethical government or public service, which is that who decides? Do we engage with our users, with families, with communities to help shape those choices? Um, so, yes, it's a really important issue and we should think about it carefully. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to ask you two quick questions. The first is, what is the where, what direction is this go, is nudging going in? Are there some new boundaries that you all are investigating? Are there some new areas that you all are that it is evolving into? Yes, again, a wonderful question, Adel. Um, there are lots of them, both in terms of techniques and areas it's being applied to. So with respect to techniques, as everyone sees in the world, new digital capabilities, the ability to test faster, online testing, for example, um, 
So before you do something in government now, you will often you could test it on a subsample of a few thousand people to see which letter works better or not. AI is a new frontier. You mentioned text um, and, and so on. We do a lot of work with bots now, right, which pop up to work out do bots work and how do people respond to them. And we've done, I think, the first randomized control trial in the world. We did it in actually also Latin America to test the efficacy of bots. We you know that would pop up and, and give you a little bit of advice, more interactive to see if they work. Because if you do them wrong, they can just be annoying. But if you do them right, they're really helpful and have big impacts. So technology and particularly data science is coming together very strongly with behavioral science because, you know, you're living into a world where maybe we don't have to have the same thing for everyone. You can have smart systems, not linked to, not least linked to idea and the digitization of services, which works out what's the right thing for you, right? Actually, so it's personalized. It's also going into new areas. So yes, there's lots of low hanging fruit, you know, getting rid of sometimes we call sludge, all the things that get in the way of doing the right thing. Um, or getting people to pay their tax on time or save or live more healthily. But there's also linked to that is going upstream, right? So we can, you could run a massive campaign um, to try and do something about the rising obesity in, in, uh, in Indian kids. Our kids are ahead of you on obesity, but you're moving in the same direction, you know, to try and get everybody to put less sugar into food, right, would be an example, or into homemade recipes or whatever. But uh, often a very powerful uh, is thing to do is to go upstream and to influence the market. So it wasn't the mother or the father who put the extra sugar in. When they bought it in the store, it already had the sugar in. So a lot of our work is, is on market design to, to the nudging upstream. So you, you may know we designed the sugar levy in British drinks, which is half the amount of sugar in British drinks. And that's part of a bigger play, which we call market design. I mean, one I would worry about in India, and I've talked to a few folks over there about it, is as so many people are moving into the digital realm, they're going to be exposed, not just to good actors, but bad actors. People who are going to try and take money, right, or offer a better deal or do transfers. Government will have a role, in our view, to make sure that that market is, is one in which we call behavioral predators, bad behavior is being picked up. We don't just leave it to our citizens and a kind of new wild west. What's the role of government to make sure that markets work well for citizens? And if I actually choose one last one, which is conflict. I mean, one thing which is fundamental about humans is that our ability to cooperate and learn from each other, right? That's an amazing thing about human beings is that we, we can meet relative strangers and cooperate and work with each other and learn from each other. How do we dial up that cooperation? And in, in, in India, especially, that would be true. So one of the great drivers of economic growth in, in countries is what's called social trust. Do you think other people can be trusted, right? I don't know what people would say on the call. We've been asking that question for years in different countries and places. So almost ask it yourself. Do you think I do, other people can be trusted? Yes or no, can't be too careful. Countries differ massively across the world on that. You can go to Scandinavian countries and 60 or 70 percent of people would say, yes, most people could be trusted. In a place like Britain or America, it would be 30 or 40 percent. In many countries in Africa and Latin America, less than 10 percent of people would say most people can be trusted. Why does this matter? Why should you be worried about this? You know, if India is going to power forward with economic growth, living in a society where you feel other people can be trusted means that information flows better. It means you can do a deal with a handshake. I don't need a lawyer to do it all because I trust other people. Or an example would be when you're expanding your business, who do you employ? Do you employ, oh, you better employ my cousin or my brother-in-law. Or actually in a high trust world, you say, I'm going to go out there and find the best person for the job, whoever they are. So this might seem you know, a few steps away, but this is behavioral science too. How do we create societies, economies within which we think other people can be trusted, right? It has a huge impact on our well-being, on our economic growth, et cetera. 
So there are lots of kind of really good 101 things we should do. Let's write our communications that people can understand what we're saying. Let's take out the friction. Let's do East. But yes, there are many really exciting and important frontiers. It's a, a really wonderful time to be a, a public servant interested in behavior and behavior, behavioral science. <clears throat> David, I'm just asking Vishal to look at some of the questions that have come uh, and ask you. And just before we go into that, uh, you know, people have asked, OK, fine, you've convinced me right now. What are the two things I should read or what resources are there for me to learn more about uh, nudge theory that's as simple as you describe it, as opposed to uh, academic text? What should I read? What should I see? Very good. By the way, I should say I, I'm a recovering academic. I used to have tenure at Cambridge, so I, I get the difference. I really do. Well, of course, I should at least mention you can always read inside the nudge unit which has got lots of useful stuff about what we've done. And, you know, we wanted to share it with other public servants in the world. So that's there. I think that's, you know, hopefully you find it useful. Um, I think there's some wonderful stuff. Some very good work done by you know, your colleagues, which is Niti Ayog, um, linked to CBC. Um, a very nice report on, um, actually it's called, I've got it in front of me, I was just reminding myself. Um, Stories of Change, which Niti Ayog put out just in 2022 which is also the use of behavioral insights in India's aspirational districts. Some very nice examples. So those would be two good ones to start with. If you want to go to source, the classic book is still people often talk about, which is Nudge, which uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein wrote. And a year or two ago, they did an updated version. They said the final edition. So there's three pretty good starts, um, I think. Um, one very practical about using it in government, Nudge, from the leading experts, you might say, Richard Thaler having got the Nobel Prize, and great work also done in India already and a growing community, such as the Niti Aayog work. Thanks, Adil. If you'll do more courses yourself, CBC will do the next level. Uh, go ahead. Thanks, Adil. Professor, I'm interested what metrics or benchmarks should be used to evaluate the success of a nudge. Uh, so, for example, as a design choice, would a litmus test for an effective nudge be scalability in one context or would it be replicability across contexts? What is it that we should really look at measuring when designing a nudge and then its effectiveness post implementation? Oh, great question, of course. So you'll gather from our work, we are we are hyper geeks. We believe in you know, really testing, did it work? So it depends, of course, on some fundamental sense. You know, what is the outcome? Um, tax is a great example because you kind of want people to pay their tax. So an outcome variable is, did the nudge lead to more people paying their tax? By the way, not just immediately, but over time. So that would be concrete. But your, your question was also about in the design of the nudge itself, right? So which is exactly right. So what is the cost of it? How difficult is it to adopt? And so when we are, we go through, sometimes we have another mnemonic, of course, to explain this, called the test framework. So tests. So it starts with target. Are you clear about what you're trying to do? Quite often you'd be surprised in government where you say, you're asking people to do this thing, but why? What, what do you actually want them to do? What's the point of it? You know, the specific behavior you want changed. So what's the target? Be clear about it. Go then to an explore phase. Be really open-minded about the possibilities before you move into the S, which is solutions. One of the key criteria for deciding a solution, exactly as you said, which is how difficult is it to do? How easy would it be to implement and to replicate? So we have had many examples where we've worked them up and thought this would be so neat, but it just in practice would be difficult to scale. Um, let me give you a real example. Um, We've done a lot of work of trying to get people back into work who are unemployed. And I know in India, actually, younger population is a significant issue there, too, um, with you. Um, we made a number of changes, some of which were very effective, where in a lot of systems, they ask people, you know, if you want to get this benefit, are you looking for work? And we would we, we developed some interventions where instead of saying, show you're looking for work, we'd said to you, what are you going to do next week? right, to get into work, to prompt people about how will you go about it, who will you ask, what jobs, 
And then people are much more likely to go into work. So that's the intervention. Why am I telling you the story? One of the things we were also interested in doing is, could we connect people with others who had got into work? We thought this would be really neat, right? So um, you imagine like someone else has got a job and you help them get a job. Could we bring them back in to talk to someone else who wants to get a job in that sector? Because a lot of work is got through your social network, which would be very elegant. But we found it very difficult to develop an intervention which we could do in scale because we would just hit practical issues. So, for example, in many Western countries, you have job centers where people are coming in. Now we have to schedule an, an appointment with the person who was in the job and the other one. And then where would we do it? Where's the room? You know, so it would, even though it was a lovely idea, we didn't, you know. So that's why we go through what's your target? Explore it. What solutions? Certainly think about could you scale it? For us, it culminates in then the second T, trial it, test it, you know, actually, did it work or not? And then they have a final S, which is then scale it. There's lots of things in the academic literature of beautiful interventions that were never scaled. And indeed, there's a very famous one within India itself. From more than a decade ago, many of you might know it. It was talked about across the world. The World Bank talked about it. Save lives with a pot of paint. You know the one? And it was people getting run over crossing railway lines in Mumbai. And someone had the great idea of people misjudge how fast a train is going. And so if you paint on the rails, right, every, you know, every few and then a gap and then some more, it helps people judge more accurately how fast a train is coming towards them. So it's a beautiful intervention. It was shown by some estimates to reduce accidents by up to 75 percent, like a really big effect in Mumbai. Great. Has that happened across India? I mean, I'm not aware of it happening across India. It's quite a simple intervention, but, you know, the implementation really matters. Not only can it be done easily again, but have you got a route to scale? You know, so, you know, we're obsessed about that. And ideally, when you're developing an intervention, just as you you mentioned it, you'd bring it bring in mind the scalability. You know, so similarly on a digital platform, a, a amazingly powerful thing. If you test it and it works. Can you literally just change a line of code and then it's done everywhere? That is a fantastic asset and we should always think about it. That's very interesting. I'm curious, is there also a framework in your mind about choosing a problem that uh, is fit for this kind of technique and thinking? Um, are there some problem sets that you wouldn't consider approaching through this mindset, for example? I'm sure there there are. I mean, that's what we often do in the explore phase is to understand, well, what is the, the nature of it? What's the real constraint? You know, um, there's no point, for example, gently nudging someone if they just don't know how to do it. They haven't got the capability or they haven't got the resource. Right. And that maybe actually there. Are, you know, it's not the only tool in the toolbox. It's a it, it's you know, there are lots of things. Sometimes you have to pass a law and just say you can't do this. Or sometimes we have to get money. Or an example would be climate change, which I know with the life campaign in, in India, and of course every country is wrestling with this question. There are some things which we can ask of individuals. We can ask, you know, can nudge them to in their mode of transport or I don't know, eat less rice and eat more millets, right? Because it'll have less impact on the water table. But there are a lot of things we have to do which are decarbonizing the grid, right? Building wind farms and solar we don't have, no point asking every citizen to do that we have to do good government and re rebuild our energy grids and systems so that doesn't sound like a nudge that sounds like hardcore big government better design the grid right and let's get to work with the incentives so it has lots of power but it isn't everything the the one thing i would say about it though is for one way of thinking about behavioral techniques it's a bit like a kind of a WD-40. Do you have WD-40? It's a, a kind of jugar type, you know, before trying to fix something, spray some oil in it, you know, just can you make it work a bit better? And there are very many things, even if they're a kind of big, you know, technical pro project where there are almost always human elements, you know. So, I mean, let's stick with the example of decarbonizing the grid. 
in many countries, people are reacting against wind farms. So these big wind turbines, and do, do they, if people think they're ugly and they hate them or they think they're killing birds, they'll fight against you. So even with a big technology, have you brought your community along? Do you look at it and think, God, that's beautiful. Like, you know, can you make it look beautiful? You know, do people feel an identity with it? And similarly, that's true for even the adoption of technology. So an example would be on green across the world. Solar panels are contagious. You know that? If you put solar panels up, your neighbors will probably do so soon after. They, they kind of spread, right? Um, but other things, for example, in Western countries, uh, heat pumps, which you can use for cooling or heating, don't spread. Why? You see the solar panel. You see the solar panel on the roof. You don't see the heat pump, right? So even technology adoption is often influenced. So I'll give you, a, again, sorry, a practical example. To drive the adoption of electric vehicles in Britain, and we've now recommend it elsewhere, when you buy an electric vehicle, by default, it has a green tag on it. And I think this is true in India when I was there last, right? That on the, the number plates for electric vehicles, they look a bit different. I don't know if it's a choice or not. But a, whoever did that, that's a very good idea. Why? Because it makes it visible. Because when Adil goes around to dinner, his very fancy important friends in, Del in Delhi, in a couple of years, they can see immediately, is he driving a, you know, a big, you know, pollution producing thing or is he an electric vehicle? Because they'll see straight away. So it, it's harnessing the human aspects, even with a big technology change. So it's like you put it through a kind of wind farm of, you know, have we thought about this from a behavioral point of view, the equivalent of the WD-40 to oil it, to make it work better? So, yes, things that it won't work for, but actually almost everywhere it can add some value. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, just to highlight, we are inching 5.15 Indian Standard Time, which was the scheduled end of our talk. Just want to check with you if you're still uh, available to extend the uh, question and answer round for another 10 minutes, if that's okay with you. I'm good for a few minutes, but it depends on other people on the call, but yes. Sure. I'm noticing uh, a couple of questions on the chat, uh, but I feel um, I'm very tempted if you can also speak a little bit about the mind uh, space uh, framework. Adil mentioned that uh, in your introduction, I think the audience would really benefit uh, if they leave this session with an understanding of the, what that's about and its applicability to public policy. Very happy to do that. So for those who don't know it, I mean, I just introduced East is a very simple, just four letters, easier to remember. Mindspace was a longer, similar so-called mnemonic to help you remember. Um, and it's one that we did back in 2009, um, actually in the Institute for Government, jointly with the British Cabinet Office. So I'll, I'll quickly walk you through it. So it's just a little bit longer. So as I said, if you believe in making it easy, <laughs> that applies also to um, mnemonics. So the mind space stood for, you know, uh, well, we'll go through the whole thing. But M was messenger. It matters who says it, right? So if Adil sends an email saying you should watch this video about behavioral science, is that more likely for people in the Indian civil service to watch it or not? Does it matter? It, the messenger might be someone very important like Adil, but it might be your mother. Your mother might be a much more important messenger. And for a lot of behavior, your mother or your mother-in-law is a very powerful messenger. So work out who is the messenger. You know, if, you, if you're asking people to do something on health, for example, maybe rather than the minister saying it, having a famous doctor say it is more important. Standing there with a stethoscope, messenger. The I is incentives. Incentives matter, they still matter, but it's also how they're constructed. What would be an example? If you want people to go to higher education or to further skills, you could pay for the course completely or contribute towards it. You might decide you're better off paying for it at the beginning. Well, pay for the first year. The first year is for free, right? Go there, try it out, see if it works. So even the design of incentives could be important and behaviorally improved. The N is norms, which relates to the social norms. What does everybody else think? They're very powerful influence on our behavior. The D is default. We touched on that earlier. What's the default option? If I do nothing, do I get in the pension or the saving scheme, right? Or do I have to do something? 
Defaults are very powerful. In everyday speak, we're all a little bit lazy, right? So if I do nothing, what happens? Defaults really matter. The S, goodness, do we do them all? Um, you know, there's various, I'll just maybe pick up a few of them. Priming is P, which is almost a timely effect, which is to do with um, what do you, what do you do in advance? You know, you prime someone for it. I'll give you a, a, a famous fun example from Chialdini. In a, it's in America, you're trying to get someone to try a new drink. There's a new crazy drink, let's suppose. And you go up to them in a shopping mall and you say, hey, you know, I don't, would you try the new drink? Most people say, no, no, thank you. Imagine you said before, hey, Adil, do you consider yourself to be an adventurous person? Most people say what? Most people say, well, yes, I am. Would you like to try this drink? Now a majority of people say yes. That's called a priming effect. I jumped over S as salience. How do you make it cut through? You know, use someone's name. David, oh, well, now I'm paying attention, right? Are we a simple example? Is it relevant to me? Um, a was, uh, goodness, I've got to remember myself, affect, <laughs> emotion, emotion matters. One of the problems often about how government thinks about things, they think about it very rationally sense, you know, financial, this is better for you, et cetera. That's not what most of our lives are about, right? They're about emotion, you know. Will it make me look more beautiful, right? That matters to people, right? The emotional side of it all. Um, C is commitment, divisive. So an example would be, if you want someone to do something, get them to commit in advance. I mentioned on, um, if you want someone to uh, vote or get an injection, you know, you say, will you promise to do this, right? You ask people to enter into a commitment, they're much, much more likely to do it, right? So that's really powerful. Um, it locks in our behavior because we want to be consistent. The last one is ego, which is a bit complicated, I realize, but is that we are normally telling ourselves stories. Actually, this is a good question. You guys should tell me, does this work in India? Is it a Western thing, right? Ego. So in weird psychology, we're the hero of our own story, right? So uh, I don't, you tell me if it's worked. If you're probably all perfect, and you're, but you know, if you've left things untidy, you didn't do the washing up at home, right? And you're, if my wife says to me, David, why didn't you do the washing up, right? Or why didn't you take your boots off when you were coming in? Well, all that mud, you've made a mess, right? What happens? Our brains are really good at coming up with explanations. Ah, no, the reason why, I, no, I, I was going to do it, but I didn't because the baby needed attending to, and I had to go and do that, Was you know, right? Or the reason, I, we're really good at coming up with reasons. Do you see what I'm saying? So a lot of human cognition is what's called rationalizing. We come up with a reason why we did it. It's pretty, it's a good, yeah, you know, where you're telling your, your workmates you didn't do the work. It's a rationalization. So what does that matter is that ideally behavioral change understands that psychology is it understands about does this make you feel good about who you are right does it work and play into that space so the mind space report i'm sorry it took a little time it's a bit more complicated it blends in a number of different approaches which is why we often say for public sector workers think east but for those who are interested, yes, it gives you a bit more depth and range. And there are a few other frameworks out there which are worth looking at. But yeah, hopefully that was a good introduction to Mindspace. Yes, thank you. Um, my colleague, uh, Mr. Vinay Brandon has a question for you. Last for the evening, uh, we'll respect your time and uh, we'll uh, uh, close post that. Go ahead, Vinay. Good evening, good evening, uh, Dr. Halpern. It's a treat to get to ask this question to you. Um, so I have a few, but I'm going to keep it very short, and I'm going to focus on civil service capacity building. Uh, so there's what is well documented is the IKEA effect, which links labor to intrinsic motivation and to non-monetary reward. So is there a way in which we can trade off levels of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation in public systems management? Broadly ensuring that one does not crowd out the other. And utilizing the mind space framework in this context, how can we use salience, ego, and incentives to sort of promote a culture, a performance culture, but also a 
public service orientation, which is called Seva Bhav in our civil services. So I'll keep it at that. Um, well, what a great question, and maybe it's a good question to end on. Um, not as I said, I think, you know, the CBC is so important. Can you build the capability of your public servants to do better? Um, and as you'll gather, my own life, that's why I spent, I served several prime ministers, and after I worked with Tony Blair, I worked setting up the Institute for Government. It was, why can we make government work better? And a key detail behind your question is public servants are also human beings, be they senior or not. And we wrote a report, which some of you might be interested in looking at from a few years ago, called Behavioral Government, which is applying it back on ourselves. So you gave one a very powerful example, which is how do you motivate people? And there's a very famous body of work around financial incentives work a bit, but they often crowd out other incentives. A very famous classic study from the 1960s was uh, getting children to do coloring and drawing, right? And one group are given um, the, the coloring pens and whatever, and they're given stars, little gold stars, but they've done lots of coloring. Another group get the coloring, but they don't get the stars. And then a little while later, you know, a day or two later, the kids are given the crayons, would they like to color? And the very interesting result is the kids who were given the gold stars were much less likely to color. And the argument is, is that you've inadvertently crowded out the the intrinsic the reason why you wanted to do it. And now you think I'm doing it for the money. And I think this is very important in public service where people have an ethos as well. It's actually true in many um, workplace studies where using financial incentives to get someone to work harder often don't work that well. They can work if it's a very specific job. I have to get this many widgets done, you know, and if I'll pay you more for them. But most public sector work isn't that, right? It involves a bit of judgment and sometimes creativity. And, and it's much harder to use financial incentives. There's a beautiful study a number of years ago where it compared the effect of using financial incentives on workers, this is factory workers, versus just the manager saying, thank you, you did a really good job. And by the way, they did one in between, which was giving pizza instead of money. I give you some, good job, guys, I bought you pizza. What did you find? In the short term, the very short term, the financial incentives boost the performance. But if you follow it over a week or two, it goes back the other way and the performance actually is worse than before when you're not using the financial incentives. So now you've got to do them all the time. Interestingly, the manager saying, thank you, guys, you did a great job. I'm really proud of you. It's a smaller initial effect, but it persists over time. The workers carry on doing it, you know, better. By the way, pizza is all exactly halfway in between. It's like a little boost early on, but it's more sticky and works better than financial incentives. So it's a really good clue, both an, a specific example of how do you motivate people? Like you want to say to people, why are you doing it, right? Go to the intrinsic reward. Because the beauty of it is you, sh you should also ask yourself, what happens when I'm not there? When I'm not there telling them to do, what do they do? Right. And if you've managed to root it in motivation and intrinsic reward, the person will do it when you're not there. Whereas if you're using intrinsic reward or sanction, as soon as you're out of the room, you're like, well, he's gone. Take it easy now, guys. Right. And um, but just last point I would say is that it's a very good thing and a really interesting as to whether we'd love to do more um, with CVC and in these areas is what are the other things like that for senior civil servants? And I'll just give you one or two. If I had to choose one, I'll give you, which is that this humility point, the more senior you become, the more likely you tend to become overconfident. It's a really important phenomenon we should all bear in mind. So you think, well, this I, I, it's my idea. It's going to work. I'm sure of it, right? And the, the more senior you become, that becomes more and more of an issue. And it's a whole body of work linked to can you help senior figures in organizations be called better calibrated, be one thing, like to make better predictions of will it work, won't it work? It turns out that's a skill that you can learn in an organization to make better judgments. Are there things that you can do, not just in your own behavior, but process-wise that can improve it? We touched on recruitment. What's the best way of getting the best people? Recruitment, humans are not very good at recruitment. 
They are, we're full of biases, it's hard to escape it, but you can design recruitment processes to take out those biases. Certainly as a senior person, you can push for that, get better people in the right job. Um, and if I had to choose one other, you, you try and design other kinds of processes which correct for our, our weaknesses as a human being. So an example would be red teaming or early on, if it's an idea, you say to someone, I want you, or we're gonna do as a group, Let's figure out how this didn't work, right? Now, group think, remember, is always pushing us to say, it's a great idea, David. It's a super, I love your idea. Let's do it, you know? You want someone to come along and say, why is it a bad idea? Like, and you actually want to build organizations that are like that, right, or teams. Don't always put it on the same person. They won't be very popular. But you periodically say, and especially as a senior leader in an organization, you give permission to do that. Say, we're going to do this thing. I want us to really think through the story. In three years' time, we look back on it and we just say, oh, my God, that was a disaster. The minister is so angry. Like, what the... Tell the story. Why did it go wrong, right? Embrace that humility and that learning. And maybe just the last, last point. If there's anything else you get from this talk or discussion, it's not just the behavioral science. It's the humility. It's being empirical. And that one of the things why... Behavioral science has had a very big contribution to many governments across the world. It's been a Trojan horse. It snuck into government, empirical testing, right? Because in the end, one of the, can I say this to you? One of the dirty secrets of governments across the world is we spend trillions of dollars and we don't know if it makes things better or worse most of the time. We really don't know because we never tested. And behavioral science, for whatever reason, it's been very empirical. And we say, is this letter better or not? Well, let's test it. Let's see if this letter was better, right? That is such an important idea. Why would you start with a letter? Why would you start with programs? And when someone brings you a new idea for a program or way of doing it, you say, you know what? That's such a good idea. Why do one version? Let's do three different versions and let's see which one of these works better and maybe with who, right? Why is that so important? It's because that is, can, can transform government and public services to be empirical. Like we've done it in medicine. We try different medicine. You wouldn't go to your doctor and they'd say, you know, it's a Monday. I'm going to give you a blue pill today. They're going to give you a pill and you think there's some evidence behind it. But a lot of what we do in government, if you really said, what was your evidence behind it? The truth would be not much. So that, you know, for all of you guys in CBC, if we can if we can make public services more empirical and humble, that's a game changer because it means it, they get better and better. Every day you can get better, right? That's a big deal. I must say, uh, we look forward to a continued partnership, Dr. Helbin. It was an absolute joy to speak with you today. It's uh, inspiring to see you get so excited while sharing your learnings. On behalf uh, of the Capacity Building Commission uh, and Karmiyogi Bharat, I thank you for taking the time to deliver today's Karmiyogi talk. I trust the audience has found your insights helpful. And a big thanks to the audience who have stayed with us. Uh, we bring that session to a close. I'll give Dr. Helbin the last word. Thank you. Look, I appreciate it. Uh, as I said, the most important thing for many governments is to figure out how they can be better at what they do. And so organizations like CBC, and more importantly, the kind of people who want to come to CBC and learn how to be better public servants. That excitement and you know, who want to who want to do better and bring it on. Wonderful. That's a wrap. Thanks for attending. Have a pleasant evening, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you all.